last week at Waypoint One, we talked about authority. Mark chapter 11, verse 27 through chapter 12, verse 12, illustrated and brought to mind the authority that Jesus has, that God has. This is important because we need to know by what authority we live our lives, especially now. As you're watching all of these different entities clamoring for authority, the government, the media, the doctors, the religious leaders, and the pop culturists, and um, should I say the uh, influencers on the internet, social media, all these people clamoring for authority in your life, where are you laying your head? W what foundations are you building? Now, we, we use this definition of authority in that meeting, I, I want to, I want to read it to you again so that we know what we're talking about. Because authority, as defined by Merriam-Webster, is this: it's the power to give orders or make decisions, the power or right to direct or control someone or something, the confident quality of someone who knows a lot about something, or who is respected or obeyed by other people a quality that makes something seem true or real. Now, in the other message, we talked about the fact that this sounds like the overreaching authority of the government, the medical advisors who are telling you to do certain medical things, even after mandating it, the, and, the, and the media trying to tell you one thing versus another and trying to influence you in believing one thing or another without by moving all the goalposts. I mean, it's really clear that even just watching the media, it's just outright lies now. But Jesus told us not to be deceived. <clears throat> so how do we not be deceived but follow authority as the Bible tells us to do? Well, it depends on where you put your authority, where you put your trust in what authority that you put. And in that time, in that story we covered, the religious leaders came to Jesus and asked him, well, why do you have the authority and who gives you the authority to overturn the tables in the temple? This racketeering wickedness that we've been a part of for century, for, for decades, uh, really, truly, decades. Annas and Caiaphas and his sons had been doing this for 30 years and would continue on for another 30, for a total of 60 years of fleecing the flocks. At what point does authority thrown out the window when the rules and everybody's following are still wicked? We talked about, we talked about, we talked about secular humanism. That idea that man can be moral outside of God's uh, God's rules. You, you can you can be a moral person outside of a moral God. See, these are the problems, and I want to talk more about authority. So, I want to further expound on the parable in chapter 12, verse 1 through 12 of Mark. It says, then he began to speak to them in parables. Jesus was speaking to these people. He had already kind of posed the question to the religious leaders. Look, I'll answer your question if you answer mine. If you can tell me the answer to the question of, is John the Baptist ministry of God or of man? If you can tell me the truth, the truth, answer the truth, then I'll tell you why I have the authority. But if not, then I'm not going to tell you. And they sheepishly tell him, I, we don't know. We don't know. They, 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 they know, but they didn't want to look weak. So they, they take the easy way out. They tell Jesus that we don't know. And he says, well, I'm not going to tell you. And then he gives them this parable. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the vine, the wine vat, and built a tower. And he leased it to the vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and they beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent them another servant, and at that time they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and they sent him away shamefully treated. And again, he sent another, 
and with him they killed and many others beating the some and killing some. And therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them saying, well, they will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And so they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? Well, he will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in his eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. And so they left him and went away. Now, before I explain this parable a little more, I want to read to you Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. This is God coming to a man named Abraham. And this is what he says. He says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. <clears throat> this is the promise that God made to Abraham. Now, Abram was not a Jew. He wasn't a Hebrew man. The nation that was created by God through his lineage became the Jewish nation, the Hebrew nation. He told him, I'm going to make you a great nation and you're going to bless the world. If the people bless you, I'll bless them. If they curse you, I'll curse them. It's understood that God had an idea. He needed to make a group of people, a nation, that would live by his edicts and would live by his obedience to him and that in them, all of God's will and all of God's love and his glory and everything else would be passed along and spread out throughout the world. That was his idea. Whether it was the Hebrews and the Jewish people sending it off to the Gentiles like you and me, where we're not Jews, we're Gentiles. But that's not how the Jewish people handled it. And Jesus knew this very well because he knew the history of the, the Hebrew nation, the Israeli nation. And so as we get into this parable, that's what this parable is all about. So let's look at the little pieces as we think about the idea of authority. Because Jesus is saying, this is a mindset of authority. And as we go through this picture, I want you to, to observe something. I want you to think about something. The question is, how do you see the landowner? He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, put a place for a vine vat, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. The landowner, the guy who created it, who is he? Well, he's God. And God made a vineyard. Now, we know throughout the Old Testament that Israel, in their agrarian culture, their agricultural culture, was compared often to vineyard, to a fig tree, to an olive branch, those kinds of things. So, in this parable, as Jesus is speaking a story, a parable, a, a story that doesn't have obvious significant spiritual understanding, but if you look deeper, it's very deeply spiritual. Jesus is saying that God created a nation, the nation of Israel, the vineyard. It says he set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower. Now this is important to understand, because this, as I see it, is the understanding of the government of Israel. God is the head of the government of Israel. God should be the head of your government and your life now. He should have authority. He should have authority in the nation that we live in. He should have ultimate authority. If you think about a hedge or a wall, a protective wall, um, 
parameters around your nation, borders around your nation, rules and laws to keep the peace. This is what he's talking about. He built a wall around the nation of Israel that, that protected it from outside and from within. Because the maybe it's the judicial idea uh, or the executive branch of the government, right? They make the rules, they make the laws. Those laws are made to protect those who are in the nation. That's what he built around it. <clears throat> he dug a place for a wine vat. Now, in the Old Testament, wine is the wrath of God. And although we talk about drinking the complete wrath of God, it's just the understanding of the fact that God has the authority to punish if you don't follow God's authority. <laughs> we see this in, in, uh, is, in Isaiah chapter 63. It's just not that it explains it perfectly, but it shows you the same imagery, the same pictures. 63 verse 1, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save, why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me, for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered uh, that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury, it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth." And just to show you that God talks about his wrath, his judgment, his punishment upon his people as treading down the winepress. And in Revelation, it talks about the fact that the nations that drink of the wrath of God, the blood will be to the bridles of the horses in the, in the, in the battle of Armageddon. So we see that if you're digging out a wine press, it's the ability to punish those who don't follow the rules that are written in the hedge. <clears throat> and so it's not one-sided. Psalm, uh, Proverb chapter 3, verse 11 and 12 tells us that, that don't despise God's chastening, for he chastens those he loves. He's a father. He's not just trying to destroy you. Instead, he's trying to get you back on the right path by punishing you and realigning your ability to get back on track so that you live your life for God, for obedience. That's the whole point of the judicial system is to, is to punish you for not following the laws and getting you back on track to living a life that bears fruit for the kingdom. That's all that was. And back in Mark, <clears throat> he talks about a tower. A tower are those who watch, who pay attention, who seek after, who look to the, uh, the threats that are coming in, who bring warning to those who are failing to see what is exactly going on. That's what Ezekiel is in chapter 33, uh, verse 7 of the book of Ezekiel. Now, he's, he talks about the fact that Ezekiel is a watchman. He's, and a watchman stands on a wall and he looks for threats. He looks for the incoming armies and he lets everybody know that, gosh, war is coming. But God takes it to a spiritual side as he's talking to Ezekiel in his chapter 33. And verse 7 says, So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, and wicked man shall die in his iniquity, in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your own soul. <clears throat> Therefore, O oh Lord, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus you say, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us and we pine away in them, how can we live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, 
O house of Israel. <clears throat> Simply put, he tells Ezekiel, hey, look, I'm going to tell you to tell them that they're in the wrong. If you do so and they listen to you and they repent and get back on track, yeah, then you've saved them. You've done your job. If I tell you to say something and you say it and they don't listen, well, then their impending doom is on their own head. You've done your job. But if I tell you to say something to them and in the fear of man, you choose not to say it to them and they die, it's on your head because I gave you the information. You're the watchman. You stand on the tower and you look for the impending judgment. And the impending judgment is coming when I tell you it's coming. <clears throat> and he's talking about sinful man. Look, change your ways. If you don't change your ways, God is going to judge you. And if you don't tell someone because you have fear and you fear the fact they may not like you, they may laugh at you, they may persecute you, then... Well, it's on it's on your head that you didn't attempt to save their souls. That's what the watchman part of this. And so you see that God has created a nation that has this system of government in it to keep the people in line and to keep them bearing fruit for the kingdom. That's what he wanted them to be. He remember it says in Second Corinthians, uh, First Corinthians, it says. Come, separate yourself from the world and come, you know, come out to me and be separated. What he wanted was Israel to stand above everybody else, to be a different kind of nation. Everybody else was involved in all kinds of horrible and wicked stuff. But Israel needed to be different. He needed them to be different so that as he had promised Abraham, he could bless everybody else with the Messiah. This is the authority that God gave Israel because God gave Israel the very distinct opportunity to be God's people, the, the voice, the mouthpiece of God to the world. And we see that they failed to do it as we continue to read through this parable in Mark. So he builds this thing and he gives it off to these vine dressers, these religious leaders. These guys are supposed to then fulfill what the word of God says to the people. But what do they do? Well, no, they fleece the flock. They make a lot of money. Their wickedness leads them into power hungry, uh, drunk with power, quite frankly. And they fail to follow this law. We see that throughout the whole Old Testament, even up into this present day as Jesus is using this story. So he gives it off, he leases it off to these vine dressers to be bearing fruit for the kingdom. And then when the time had come, God had sent prophets, the servants, the prophets, to go taste to see if Israel was doing what God had wanted them to do. Remember, Ezekiel was a prophet, Isaiah was a prophet, Daniel was a prophet. God speaks to them about things, about what he wanted them to be doing, and the prophets then went and spoke the word of God in an effort to get everybody back on track for the authority that he was trying to get them to do because he wanted them to be a special and set aside people. But what do we see here? The vine dressers treated them poorly. He stoned them, imprisoned them, treated them bad, killed them. All these horrible things up to the point where God sends his son. He says, well, they'll, they'll respect my son. If they were reading the Bible, they'll understand the Messiah. And my son, the Messiah, they'll respect them because they'll know that he's the one to deliver them. But they didn't and they killed him too. And so what does Jesus say? This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And so they took him, and they killed him, and they cast him out of the vineyard. And then so Jesus says in verse 9, Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? What will God do to the nation? Well, he will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and is it marvelous in our eyes? <clears throat> That's a question. Is it marvelous in our eyes? This is what had happened? Because this is what happened. <laughs> These guys killed Jesus, so God took the hand of the vineyard away, destroyed the nation. The nation was, was judged. By 70 AD, Rome came in and overthrew the entire nation of Israel, destroyed the temple, burned down Jerusalem, and the diaspora happened. Everybody was spread out throughout the entire world. Jews disappeared. And 
Israel was never a nation again, not until 1948, May of 1948, when God pulled them back together, as seen in Ezekiel chapter 37 in the prophecy of the dry bones. But when Jesus told them, look, you, you didn't understand your, your visitation of the Messiah, and therefore they're going to come and overthrow your government, and they're going to overthrow your nation, and you're going to be destroyed, and you're going to be run off. That was directly against what he had said here. He said, look, you guys treated you guys treated the vineyard wrong, and therefore God took the vineyard away from you and gave it over to the church. In Acts chapter 1, when the Holy Spirit came and rested upon the disciples, Jesus became the chief cornerstone. The builders of the vineyard rejected the chief cornerstone, Jesus. And Jesus became the chief cornerstone of the church. And now, right now, Judaism is a failing religion in a, in, a, in a nation that is failing. Nobody, because God has turned his sight away from the Jewish people, they've become very secular. But at the end of the church age, when the rapture happens and the church is gone, God will turn his attention back to Israel. By the way, if you hear in your teachings and your studyings that God has changed his mind, has walked away from Israel forever, and the church is the people of God and not Israel anymore, it's a false teaching. It's called replacement theology. It's wrong. Because if you read in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, you will find out that God has a plan for Israel. He'll turn his face back towards Israel. He'll protect him in Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39. He will protect a quarter to a third of their population in the last three and a half years of the tribulation. But only after the seven-year tribulation, which is punishment towards the Jewish people for not understanding that Jesus is their Messiah. That is uh, heavy stuff. They don't know that yet. They haven't seen it. But God will turn his attention back to the Jewish people after the church, the people that took over the, vi the vineyard, is gone in the rapture. But here's the point. We're talking about authority. And the way you look at this parable is the way you see authority. How do you see the landowner? If you're a vine dresser, you're a servant of God, and you see that the vineyard now the church, back then Israel, or the church, both are still the people of God. We have to understand that. But in this place, as you and I are seeing it, the church, led by the head of his son Jesus Christ, as the people of God, we're the vineyard now. So if you're a servant in the vineyard, is the vineyard God's, and therefore Jesus' vineyard, or is it yours? And that's the point. This is the, this is the, the decisive understanding about authority in this story. Well, authority comes from two different visions of what we see as reality. When you look at the, uh, when you look at the world, you can look at it in one of two ways. You can have a secular worldview, which means you take all of the stuff you've learned and history and what you're observing and what you see and the news and the media and all this garbage that's going around. And you look at the world through that lens and you'll understand you'll have a worldview, a secular worldview. On the other side, you could have a biblical worldview, which means you look at the world through the lens of the Bible. That means you look at the Bible, understand what the word says, what God says happened or will happen, because he tells us the end from the beginning, so you will believe him. And you will take the evidence that you see based on what you understand of the Bible, and it'll all make sense to you, and that's how you'll see the world. Now, this becomes a really big deal when you look at the first 11 chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 through Genesis 11. And that's the point in which people start to build great contention. Because there are things written in the Bible in those first 11 chapters that people don't believe. I'm going to back this secular versus worldview, or secular worldview versus this biblical worldview. Let's take the creation of the world. The Bible tells us 
that the earth was created in six literal days. The earth and the stars and the universe and all the things on it and the water and the animals and man and everything else. And then on the seventh day, God rested. That's what the Bible says. Secular worldview would tell you that it's billions of years old, hundreds of billions of years old. Now, how do we know? How do we know that that's true? Well, secular people who don't want to put God's word into it, have to go and find some truth. And that truth seems to make sense based on what they're observing. The problem is you're, that the, the, those in the biblical worldview are looking at the same evidence because nobody was there. Another one is the flood. Did you know that the flood happened in a very, very quick uh, point of time? The flood was complete. It covered the highest mountain. And, the, and we know that because there are marine animal fossils at the top of Mount Everest. The people won't believe that, even though most nations in the world have a story about a boat with some people on it that were saved from a worldwide flood. Why is it that everybody has the same story? It's because they all came from the same place. Genesis tells us all kinds of different things. It talks about marriage and about gender, about nationalism, about capital punishment, about pride, about being fruitful and multiplying across the world, about nations, about tongues, about, about borders. And is it any definition? So you read through those and you find out why we wear clothes. When, when did we start eating meat? What does the rainbow really mean? Well, all these things are in chapter 1 through 11. Isn't it any wonder that if the authority of God in chapter 1 through 11 is very distinct on what it says, that our nation who is running away from God, being influenced by the world and by the lust of the flesh and by the devil, would turn on all of this stuff. Pride? Pride's a sin. It's a dangerous sin. God speaks against pride, yet pride is celebrated in our nation. Pride this and pride that, and a pride parade and national pride and pride, pride, pride. It's against God's rules. Capital punishment. It tells us, he says, God says in the first 11 chapters of the Bible, if you kill someone, your life must be taken as well. But we don't do that because we see it in some sort of equality kind of issue. And we make arguments about that. But you notice that we're, there's a problem. There's always discussion about this issue. How about being fruitful and multiplying? He told Noah and his sons, be fruitful and multiply and inhabit and the whole earth. Yet we're trying to control the population for climate reasons. That China is trying to bear however many children you can have, and that's going to start. They're giving rewards out to royalty for saying that they're only going to have one child or two children or whatever else. That's not what the Bible says. Be fruitful and multiply because children are people of God. God created them. He'll make them when he wants them. Nationalism? How about nationalism? Did you know that everyone is trying to get into a one world order? And the one world order is described it's prophetically in Revelation chapter 13. But did you know that in chapter 11 of Genesis, we were already a one world global nation at the Tower of Babel, and God had to go down there and confuse everybody and spread them out throughout the whole world. That's how it started, and then everything, then everything spread out and became nations. Let me show you something in, in Acts chapter 17 really quick, just as a really quick idea. <clears throat> Acts chapter 17 says, um, Verse 25, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things, talking about God. Uh, verse 26, and he has made from one blood, we're all from one blood, the races, nations, and tongues, we're all from the same place. We're all from the same place. There's no such thing as, we're not, we're not different. We're not different. We have a different shades of brown in our skin. That's the only thing that makes us different. From one blood, every nation, men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. That means God created national boundaries. <clears throat> Nations, tongues, different people. That's what God wanted. Yet we're trying to get together in its own 
little <laughs> one world order, one world government. We're going to hand it over to one guy. Remember, it was Nimrod in Genesis chapter 11. Now it's going to be the Antichrist. You notice that all of these things were we're, we're finding pride, capital punishment, marriage, gender, uh, being fruitful and multiplying, um, all these things, nationalism, all this stuff is coming under attack right now. Why do you think it is? It's because it's the word of God under the very pretense of the very beginning and the, uh, it's, the, it's the groundwork of God. And that's where we are. So it's no wonder that everything is failing as we're trying to get into this secular humanism problem where we don't need God. We can be, we could do it on our own and therefore we are tolerant of sins. We're tolerant of what God says are sins and we're being judged for that. That's happening. We have to understand where the authority comes from and we have to understand it's not from us. It's not from the vine dressers. It's from the owner of the vineyard who is away. You have to ha give respect where respect is due. So these people said, well, this is my vineyard and it's my rules and it's my hedge and it's my tower and it's, my, all, it's all mine. No, it's not. It's owned by God and God oversees it. Just read Romans chapter 13, verse 1 through 7 again about governments and government authorities being given by God. Well, all of this is really important. And because of the Genesis 1 through 11 issue, I'm going to start in the next few videos to speak about the ideas by reading it verse by verse throughout a number of videos and then giving commentary and understanding the very root, the grassroots of what God wished for us to be in the very beginning when he created the heavens and the earth, when he created us in his likeness. These things are far more important. And if you're looking for more, uh, more apologetics issues, more um, answers uh, to, to your greatest questions in Genesis chapters 1 through 11, you can check out uh, websites like AnswersInGenesis.org or AlwaysBeReady.com. Awesome apologetics, um, talking about the flood, talking about fossils, talking about biology and cellular biology, how things change, how how they're, the difference between macroevolution and microevolution and all of these things, how, how you got all the animals on the ark and how all of them spread out and multiply, all of those things are beautifully illustrated in that website. In many different uh, news articles by scientists that are up and, uh, up and coming in their field. Look, here's the thing. When you give God the authority then you fear God and are obedient to God, and the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. When you understand where authority comes from, and you live your life to stand on the authority of God, then everything starts to fall into place, and you'll see without moving all the goalposts what God meant and wished for your life. I uh, hope to see you in the next few videos about the book of Genesis, chapter 1 through 11. I hope to open your eyes to some very amazing things that are written there if you've never seen it before. And as always, have a good week and be blessed. Take care.